So why do we need all this fancy technology? Big telescopes, big computers, space rockets. It's all pretty expensive after all, so why do we need it? Well, astronomy is very hard to do. It involves some extreme measurement quantities. So let's take a look at a few of those one by one. So our first problem is that astronomical objects tend to be extremely faint. Uh, this can be either because of power or because of distance. Um, after all, a candle can be pretty hard to see if it's 30 metres away, uh, but also a very powerful searchlight might be hard to see if it's 30 kilometres away. In just the same way, a small rock um, that's near to the Earth may be quite hard to detect before it hits the Earth. Um, on the other hand, the most powerful quasar that we know can still be hard to see if it's right at the edge of the universe. So let's have a little think about what makes things um, hard to measure, what determines the brightness of an object. Let's imagine the light spreading out from a star. So here's our star here, and light is spreading out from the star into an ever larger and larger spherical surface. Okay, so the light is spread over that spherical surface. What determines how bright it seems to us as we catch the light is how much light we get per unit area. So now imagine putting a, um, a detector of the same size um, at lots of different distances. So as you go further away, the fraction of the overall light that this is catching is getting smaller. So the apparent brightness of an object is going to depend as 1 over the square of the distance because it depends on the total surface area of that, of that sphere. So, if an object is 100 times further away, it's going to be 10,000 times fainter. So that's a problem. So if this is the, the sun here, the sun is pumping out huge amounts of energy, uh, something equivalent to 10 billion hydrogen bombs going off every second. It's enormous. But by the time that light reaches the Earth, it's diluted an awful lot. Uh, so that the light actually falling on the surface of the Earth uh, is on average about 1.4 kilowatts. So that's still enough to warm you up, uh, but a lot less. Now um, imagine transporting yourself to the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri. That's 270,000 times further away than we are from the Sun. Uh, and then the light from a star like the Sun at that distance uh, will be 100 billion times fainter. Uh, so you can still see about that with the naked eye. Uh, but the trouble is that many astronomical objects, the things we want to measure, are another factor of 100 billion times fainter than that. So making astronomical measurements is very hard. So our next problem is that we want to deal with some pretty extreme ang angles, uh, both big ones and small ones. So sometimes we deal with big angles on the sky, we might want to map the whole of the Milky Way, or we might be mapping out a big region of the sky in order to measure millions and millions of galaxies. On the other hand, most of the time in astronomy, what we're really obsessed with is getting the sharpest possible pictures. So it's all about angles. What angular size something appears uh, uh, to us, viewing it from, from here. So now imagine um, uh, an object here and you're seeing it from different distances. So seen from here, it's a, it's a pretty good angle on the sky. On the other hand, if we're viewing the same object from a larger distance, then that makes a smaller angle on the sky. So that's how angles work and it goes linearly with distance. So let's get this into perspective. Um, when we measure angles, mathematicians measure angles in, uh, in radians, but astronomers like sailors like degrees, minutes and seconds. So let's put that into perspective. So if we take the whole of um, the circle and we divide it into 360 parts, um, then that's one degree. If we take um, one degree and divide that into 60 parts, then that makes one arc minute. And if we take... Um, uh, one arc minute and divide that into 60 parts, that's one arc second. Now, one arc minute is about what you can resolve with the human eye. And to put that into perspective, 
Um, if you imagine taking a, a DVD like this here and holding it 400 meters away, that's about one arc minute. Now, one arc second is like having this DVD 24 kilometers away. So you can't resolve that with the human eye, but if you're looking through a telescope, you can. And this is about the limit of what you can see um, with a ground-based telescope. On the other hand, about a tenth of that is what you can get um, with the Hubble Space Telescope. So this makes an enormous difference. So I'm going to show you a picture of the Milky Way. First of all, uh, you're looking at it um, uh, blurred to eyeball resolution. Now you can't see this faint with your eye, but if you could, that's what the Milky Way would look like. And then in this next picture, you say this, see the same region of the sky, uh, but at one arc second resolution, as you can get with a, with a big telescope. And you can see it makes an enormous difference so you can actually see what's going on. So here's another picture now. This is a very distant galaxy in this case, uh, as you would see it with a, um, a ground-based telescope, one arc second resolution. And here it is again with Hubble Space Telescope at 10th arc second resolution. And again, it transforms what you can understand about that object. So angles are crucial. Our next problem is that detecting different kinds of light needs completely different technologies. So let me explain why this matters in astronomy. It's because astronomical objects cover a huge range of temperature. Uh, so, for example, here in this room right now, it's about 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, but, of course, as physicists, we prefer to measure things above absolute zero. Absolute zero is at minus 273 Celsius. So it's about 293 degrees Kelvin, uh, i.e. above absolute zero here in this room. So that's fairly typical for, for a planet around a star. Now, on the other hand, uh, the coldest molecular clouds in the interstellar medium can be just 20 degrees above absolute zero. The surface of the sun is 6,000 degrees. Uh, an accretion disk around a black hole can easily be 10 million degrees. So the light changes uh, when objects are different temperatures. If you take an object and heat it up, two things happen. The first is that you just get much more light in total. And the second thing is that the light shifts to shorter wavelengths as you get hotter. And you get completely different kinds of radiation. So let me spell that out and tell you why it matters. So if we have something at about 20 degrees Kelvin, K for Kelvin, um, like that interstellar cloud, that's going to make microwaves. And to detect that, we need radio dishes, radio receivers, etc. On the other hand, something at about 300 degrees Kelvin, like the surface of a typical planet, that makes infrared radiation. So to detect that, we need infrared detectors. Um, OK, so what about the surface of the sun, something at 6,000 degrees Kelvin? That makes regular visible light. So to detect that, these days we use CCD cameras, just like the camera you have in your phone. On the other hand, something at 10 million degrees Kelvin, well, that gives you X-rays. To detect X-rays, you need an X-ray telescope and X-ray detectors, but also you need to go into space. Astronomy is famously the science of big numbers. We talk about astronomical numbers. So, for example, the Milky Way has got something like 100 billion stars in it, maybe as many as 400 billion. We're still not quite sure. Uh, strangely enough, the number of galaxies in the observable universe is pretty similar, about 100 billion objects. Now, we can't possibly measure and catalogue every single one of all those stars and all those galaxies individually, but we do make databases in modern astronomy that are pretty scarily big. Uh, so, for example, this picture you're looking at here, this is a map of the Milky Way in the infrared, and this database has about a billion objects in it. Now, what we do is to run our computer over the image, recognising each one of those dots as a star. We measure a variety of properties for each one of those stars. So we turn this image into a giant table, uh, as you're seeing here. 
and that table has one row per star and each of the columns is a different item of information um, about that star. And sometimes in modern astronomy we want to trawl through a huge table like this trying to find exactly the information we want about exactly one particular star or a handful of stars. That processing takes pretty big computers and that's a challenge we're going to take up in week five. So most of the universe changes rather slowly. Uh, the universe as a whole has been evolving over billions of years and even the most massive stars which burn their fuel very quickly uh, take a few million years to burn through their fuel. So most of the universe is relatively stately by human terms but some things happen fast. A supernova explosion can rise up within a few days and decay over a few months. A gamma ray burst can happen in a few milliseconds. Uh, a rock heading towards the earth that may be dangerous can change its position radically in a few hours. So some things do happen fast and those are becoming very important in modern astronomy, those variable events. Dealing with those poses a lot of challenges, technical challenges but also organisational challenges and social challenges. How do we share out our telescope time to deal with that sort of situation? How do we respond rapidly to alerts that come at us over the internet? Um, all those are very interesting technical challenges.